Good morning. For a call to worship this morning, I'd like to read from Psalms 100. It says this, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness endures to all generations. We would like to welcome you this morning. We have some announcements that we'd like to highlight. Um, the elders will meet on Monday at 6.30 here at the church. Um, and then the, not this Monday, but next Monday will be the CWF Secret Sister Party. So that's where they find out who their secret sisters were for the last year and where they pick their new ones. And I believe that's at 6.30, is that it correct? It starts at 6. Okay. And we will have a solid supper. And if they're not going to be able to attend, but want to be included for the following year, um, fill out a recipe card and give it to me and I'll be sure that they get in the drawing. And that's about it. Okay. Everybody's so. welcome, even if they're, even if they don't want to be involved in the, in the, exchange if they're a lady so next not this monday but the next monday will be this yes the first will be the secret sister reveal party it will be at six <laughs> o'clock they'll have a salad um, and every, all the ladies are invited to attend if you are going to not be able to be there but still want to participate in the secret sister exchange please fill out the information about i think it has your name your birth date and your likes and interests and favorite colors and that kind of stuff and then uh they'll add you to the to the drawing for the secret sisters for the next year and um i guess that's it everybody's well all all the women are welcome so um the church annual meeting and carrying dinner will be on the 30th, that's next Sunday. His hands, I don't know if this is the final number, but the email that I received um, earlier was that they had received over 15,431 pairs of shoes. So that's kind of cool. Um, Mary Sue needs all of the bills turned in by the 24th, which is tomorrow. So she can close out the books for the fiscal year. Um, are there any other, before we go to people, are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? It's good to be back. I can honestly say that the very first thing that when I got the, my stuff inside the door is I walked over to the thermostat and I turned it down from 78 degrees down to 70 <laughs> after being at camp all week. So um, if there aren't any other announcements, we have several people that we want to mention on our prayer list. So I think it was Monday, uh, Bill Mefford, which would be Alex's dad, was taken into the hospital and he was having a brain bleed. So they had to do emergency, uh, it was a subdural hematoma, I think, is the fancy word for that. And they had to do emergency surgery on him and then he went into ICU. And then um, Kay also went into Mercy and she had um, pneumonia in her lungs so she was up on the ninth floor so Mary Sue ran into Alex while she was there at the hospital and they were kind of surprised to see each other uh, Mary or uh, Kay has been moved down to the seventh floor which is uh, for therapy but we'd ask to continue to keep both of them in your prayers um, Steve Graham uh, we asked I don't have an update on him but he has been in the hospital with pancreatitis um, and that's been kind of a recurring thing for him. So we ask to kind of keep him in your prayers. Um, we ask to continue to keep Betty in your prayers. She's still got that pinched nerve with the hip pain and stuff going on. Um, and Jim Carver, uh, we mentioned him last week. Uh, he has a pacemaker, but they're going to have to put a pacemaker with a defibrillator in it as well. So we'd ask to keep Jim in your prayers also. Now, are there any others that we want to update or mention at this time? If not, 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our great and our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne once more this morning, it is our desire to lift you up and to praise you for you're a great and a mighty and an awesome God, and you're worthy of all of the praise and the honor and the glory that we can give to you. As we come to this part of our service, Lord, we just lift up to you those that are on our prayer list. Lord, we have so many that need your very real and very special touch. We ask, Lord, that you be with Lisa as she's uh, being treated for her cancer, that you would just reach down and touch her and help to bring healing to her. We ask, Lord, that you be with Scott Shook as he is dealing with cancer. And, Lord, we just pray that if it be your will, that you just reach down and, and bring healing to him also, whether that comes through your hands or the hands of the doctors. We pray that you be with Kay, that you just give her a, a recovery from her pneumonia and that you'd bring healing to her, that you'd strengthen her body so that she can go home and do the things that she wants and desires to do. We pray, Lord, that you be with Steve Graham as he is dealing with pancreatitis, and that you bring healing to him. We pray, Lord, for Bill, and we're just grateful that he came through the surgery as well as he did, that he is doing better, and that you just continue to be with him as he recovers and bring healing to him. We pray, Lord, also that you would just be with Betty as she continues to go through therapy and, and deal with the struggles that she's having with her hip pain and the pain that's shooting down her leg. And Lord, we just pray for her that she would feel your presence and know that you're with her and that, Lord, you just bring relief to her from her pains and her struggles. We ask, Lord, that you would just be with um, each and every one that's been mentioned this morning. Lord, with the uh, premature twins, that you would continue to be with them as they... As they uh, grow and and gain their strength lord for each and every one that's on our prayer list and for those that have been mentioned this morning we just ask that you move in a mighty way and bring victory to your people it's in jesus precious and holy name that we pray amen our first hymn this morning is hymn number 95 revive us again we'll sing first second and fourth verse hymn number 95 like to turn over to hymn number 487. We'll sing Sunshine in My Soul verses first, second, and last. 487. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than closing in the earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments flow. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. A carol to my King, and Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus 
shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today. And hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now. For joys laid up above. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Then if you'll turn over to hymn number 490, 490, we'll sing Rock of Ages, first, second, and fourth verse. Rock of ages left for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from the graven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy lost demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou while I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide thyself in for this morning's community meditation, I'm reading a passage entitled Expecting Jesus, with scripture taken from Matthew 24, 44, where it says, You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. My friend Paul was awaiting the arrival of a technician to repair his refrigerator when he saw a text on his phone from the appliance company. It read, Jesus is on his way and is expected to arrive at approximately 11.35 a.m. Paul soon discovered the technician's name was indeed Jesus. But when can we expect Jesus, the Son of God, to arrive? When he came as a man 2,000 years ago and suffered the penalty of our sin, he said that he'd be back, but only when the Father knew the precise day or hour of his return. What difference? might it make in our day-to-day -day priorities if we did know the morning or the moment or the evening our Savior is coming back to earth. Jesus cautioned us to be ready for his return. The Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. He reminded us to keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. On the day of Christ's return, we won't get an alert on our phone to give us a heads up. So, through the power of the Spirit working through us, let's live each day with the perspective of eternity, serving God, and taking advantage of every opportunity to share his message and love of hope with all who will listen. Now this morning, if you'd join me, our communion hymn is 453. We'll sing the first, second, to stand the fourth verse. <laughs> Uh... 
bowed before you at this communion table we pray for the great sacrifice that Jesus made God you sent your son to this earth to save mankind because we no longer were able to be close to you you sent your son so that he could be the sacrifice, the way to you, way back to you for us. As we remember the Gospels and how Jesus taught his disciples how to love and be kind and sharing and humble, Lord, we ask that as we look upon these sacraments today, that we too might represent this community and go out and share that gospel with others. As we take of the communion <clears throat> meal today, we are remembering the great sacrifice on the cross that Jesus made and the body that was broken was symbolized by the bread that we eat and the blood that flowed is symbolized by the wine that we drink. Lord, let us always take these communion sacraments seriously, and we ask that you will help us to be great and willing servants for you. We ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Father, as we come to this part of our service, we pause to reflect 
on the many blessings that you have bestowed on each and every one of us. Lord, you've been so very good to us, and you've blessed us in so many, many different ways. As we reflect on those blessings, we give back a portion of that that you've so freely given. And as we do so, we ask for your continued blessing on both the gift and the giver. Help us, Lord, to use those gifts to reach out to our community and to our world with the love of Jesus to all who will listen. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. I'd like to start this morning by telling a story. There's a story about a bus driver and a minister who are standing in line to get into heaven. The bus driver approached the gate and St. Peter said, Welcome. I understand that you are a bus driver. Since I'm in charge of housing, I believe I found the perfect place for you. See that mansion over the hilltop? That one is yours. The minister heard all this and began to stand a little taller. He said to himself, if a bus driver got a place like that, just think what I'll get. The minister approached the gate and St. Peter said, welcome. I understand that you are a minister. Do you see that shack in the valley? St. Peter had far, hardly gotten the words out of his mouth when the shocked minister said, I was a minister. I preached the gospel. I helped teach people about God. Why does that bus driver get a mansion and I get a shack? Sadly, St. Peter responded, Well, it seems that when you preached, people slept. When the bus driver drove, people were busy praying. <laughs> You know, as we look around us and we look at all of the chaos and the different things that are going on around us, there can be kind of a feeling of helplessness that comes. What can a person do against such a huge problem like the ones that we see around us today? This morning, I'd like to share something really important that you can do to make a difference with what's going on around us. What is it that we can do in the face of all of the chaos and division and evil that's around us? We can pray. James tells us that Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Now, we've experienced droughts before. But none of us have gone three and a half years without any rain. Alfred Tennyson said this. He said, pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. Prayer is important. And this morning, I'd like to look at four ways to make your prayer life more effective. In James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, it says this, reading from the New Living Translation. If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking, but when you pray, be sure you really expect him to answer. For a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. People like that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. They can't make up their minds. They waver back and forth in everything that they do. The first thing we can remember to make our prayers more effective is to seek God's presence. To seek God's presence. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God is speaking and he says this, If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Do you notice there that I've underlined that God says there to seek his face?
Have you ever tried to talk to somebody who's not really paying any attention to you? You know how annoying it is, don't you? You know how annoying it is when you're talking to someone and it seems like they're not paying any attention to you and you say, what did I just say? And you're especially annoying when they repeat it back to you, right? (laughs) Because we want their attention. We want their eyes focused on us when we're speaking. Why would we think that God would be any different? God wants us to seek his presence when we pray. There is a story about a man. I believe his name was John Hyde. Many referred to him as praying Hyde. It might have been Henry. I can't remember if it's John or Henry Hyde. Um, he was a missionary who uh, left England to go to the mission field. And he was a man of tremendous prayer. And he had been to the mission field and he had come back on furlough for a little bit and he went to this revival that was not being very well attended. And so um, after the revival service, he went to pray with the minister. And they went into this room and they prepared to pray. And the minister said, Hyde said nothing. And minutes went by and he said nothing and the minister was beginning to wonder if if Hyde had fallen asleep or or what was going on and then he said he began to feel the presence of God come into the room in this powerful way like like you could just feel God's presence and he said it was at that moment that Hyde began to pray You see, sometimes I think that we're so busy when we pray, we're in such a hurry that when we pray that we aren't really seeking God's presence. Or when we do pray, we're in such a hurry that when we pray, we finish up our prayer and we've moved on so fast that God doesn't have time to answer even if if He wanted to. You see, if we want to have effective prayer, we need to seek God's presence to make sure that we're in the right frame of mind when we pray and to seek Him. Because Christianity, this thing that we have with Jesus, is all about the relationship. We want to make it a checklist. We'd like to have a list that we can just go down and, and went to church on Sunday, check, tithe, check, you know, um, read my Bible, check, got my list done, everything's good, I'm, I'm ready to go to heaven. But it doesn't work that way. It's about our relationship. When Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name? Did we not preach in your name? Did we not heal in your name? Did we not do all of these things in your name? And he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't know who you are. The Bible says that God knows you to the point that he has the very hairs of your head numbered. That's a lot easier job for me than some of the rest of you, right? But it's not that God doesn't know who you are. When he says, I never knew you, he's saying that we never had a relationship. We didn't have a relationship. Christianity is about the relationship. You know, somebody, one of the kids was asking me about... Uh, the other class that I was teaching was on God, uh, the plan of salvation and, and uh, God's plan of redemption. And this idea of how do we know if we're saved or lost. And I said to them, it's not like I 
am, accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, and I'm baptized, and I'm saved, and then I tell a lie, and I'm lost, and then I ask God to forgive me, and I'm saved, and then I, you know, uh, I covet something that my neighbor has, and then I'm lost, and then I ask God to forgive. It's not like you're in and out, right? You're either in or you're out. If, if I am saved, and I, in a moment of carelessness, say something sinful with my tongue, and then I happen to step out onto Main Street and I'm struck by a Mack truck and killed, that doesn't mean that I'm lost because I didn't ask God to forgive me for my carelessness with my tongue. Right? I'm either saved or I'm lost. I'm not bouncing in and out like a yo-yo. You can be lost. I believe you can be lost after you're saved. But it's be through deliberate, willful, continual sin. Hebrews 10, I think, bears that out. But if we want to have an effective prayer life, we need to pursue the relationship with Jesus. It's not so much about what you know as who you know. Second, effective prayer requires faith. Effective prayer requires faith. Matthew 12, 18 through 21 says this, in the morning, as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry, and he noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs on it, but there were only leaves. He said to it, may you never bear fruit again, and immediately the fig tree withered up. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Then Jesus told them, I assure you, if you have faith, and do not doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may God lift you up and throw you into the sea and it will happen. And then notice what I have underlined there. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. I know that I've used this illustration before, but there are principles by which the supernatural world is governed. You don't just wake up in the morning floating on the ceiling because gravity has somehow suddenly stopped being a thing, right? There are laws that govern this physical world, and because we know what they are, we can work around them. So we can take this airplane that weighs hundreds, maybe thousands of pounds, and we can suspend it in the air because we understand the laws by which this world is governed. If God created this world with laws by which we're governed every day, doesn't it seem reasonable that the spiritual world that we don't see is also governed in a similar way? That there's laws and principles that govern the spiritual world just like there are laws and principles that govern the physical one. I think absolutely that's true. I think that one of those principles that governs the way that God is able to move and to work is faith. Having faith. Now, when I was growing up and I was in Sunday school, um, we quoted, we looked at Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And we emphasize the hope for and the not seen. And the teacher said anything that you don't understand, anything that doesn't make sense, those things you just have to accept on faith. But I think that's wrong. As I've gotten older, I don't think that's the way it is. I think we've emphasized the wrong part of that verse. That what we should be emphasizing, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the conviction or the evidence of things not seen. God isn't expecting us to just have this blind leap of faith, but that he's giving us substance and evidence and, and conviction and things that we can 
trust to accept so that when we don't understand, we can accept those things too. When you walk into the room in your house and you flip the light switch, you expect something to happen, right? Unless you haven't paid your light bill or unless a big storm has gone through, you expect when you flip that light switch that the lights are going to come on, right? You have faith that when you flip that switch, the lights are going to come on. Why is that? Is it just as blind faith? No. It's when you flip that switch before, the lights have always come on, right? Unless there's some kind of extenuating circumstance. You know that somebody wiser than you has designed this light system so that when you flip that switch, the lights come on, right? It's designed to work that way. Your past experience tells you that that's the way that that works. And so when you go and you walk to that switch, you expect those lights to come on. The same thing is true for us. We can trust God even in the things that we don't understand because God has always been faithful in the past. We have that past experience to fall back on. We can trust God because we know that he's in control. And so faith comes from those things. And so when I pray, I can pray believing that God is going to act and to move. Faith is important. It's important in the person who is praying. In Matthew 15, 21 through 28, it says this. Jesus left that place and went to the area of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the area came to Jesus and cried out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter has a demon and she's suffering very much. Jesus answered and said, God sent me only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. Then the woman came to Jesus again and bowed before him and said, Lord, help me. Jesus answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. The woman said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. I will do what you asked. And at that moment, the woman's daughter was healed. In this particular instance, the faith was not so much in the daughter, but it was in the one who was doing the praying. And because her faith was so great, God granted her request, even though he told her that he had been sent to the Israelite people, not to the Gentile people at that moment. Right? I missed a spot in my sermon, so I'm going to jump up there. I don't know if Shelly will be able to follow me or not, but there's also the importance of faith in the person that's being healed. The importance of faith, faith in the person that's being healed. So in Matthew 10, 20 and 21, it says this, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned to her and saw her and said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. So we see that faith in the person who is receiving the help is important. Faith in the person who is asking for the help is important. And that If we don't have faith, then it can affect our prayer life as well. So there are results from the lack of our faith also. In Matthew 13, 54 through 58, it says this. It says, He went to to his hometown and taught the people in the synagogue. And they were amazed. They said, Where did this man get this wisdom and this power to do miracles? He is just the son of a carpenter. His mother is Mary, and his brothers are James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And all his sisters are here with us. Where then does this man get all these things? So these people were upset with Jesus. 
But Jesus said to them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and in his own home. So he, and I want you to notice that. So he did not do many miracles there. Why? Why? Because they had no faith. Faith is one of those principles which allows God to move. Because there are rules that govern the supernatural world. There's some more verses on faith. We're not going to go through them. But Shelly's going to put a list of them up here. Maybe in just a second, hopefully. The next slide. We see the centurion's faith in Matthew 8, 5 through 13. We see faith of friends in Matthew 9, 2 through 8. We see the effects of not having faith in Mark 6, 1 through 8. And we see what faith can do in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Faith is very important. Believing that God is going to move and answer your prayer is essential if you want your prayer life to be effective. Um, there's a man by the name of John or Robert Morris Jr. that um, would come and visit my dad on occasion. And he said what he truly believed is that when you were praying for something, that you should see the result as you're praying for it in your mind. <clears throat> so as you are praying for someone to be healed, in your mind, you should see them as they are healed. I think that's part of that idea of believing and faith when we pray. Thirdly, effective prayer comes from believers praying together. Effective prayer comes from believers praying together. In Matthew 18, verses 19 through 20, it says this. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Also I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about something and pray for it, it will be done for you by my Father who is in heaven. This is true, because if two or three people come together in my name, I am there with them. Jesus says that there is something special about agreement in prayer. When Christians agree about something in prayer, it makes our prayer that much more powerful. In our bulletin, we have that section of prayer concerns. People that need God's touch. People who are ill, people who are struggling with cancer. People who have aches and pains that they just can't really seem to get rid of. Why, why do we put that in our bulletin? Because we want you to pray for them. And when Christian people pray together, it gives power to our prayers. There's power that comes with agreement in prayer. Sometimes I feel like God has given us these powerful tools, these weapons of spiritual warfare. And Satan has convinced us to not use them. God has shared with us everything that we need to know to have a relationship with him that's in this book. But this book will do you no good at all if you don't know what's in it. When we were going through our salvation class, the steps of salvation, the very first step that we talk about is that you have to hear the gospel. You have to hear the good news about Jesus. Why is that important? Because you can't know what you don't know. You can't know what you don't know. Um, I, I used this illustration in the class, and I said, uh, I, said I, I don't have the money to do it, and I'm not going to do it. But if 
because these were all fifth graders, right? We had fifth and sixth grade in our groups. And I taught one sixth grade class and I taught one fifth grade class. And I said, if I had the money to give each of you a thousand dollars, if you would ask me for it, no strings attached. All you have to do is just ask me for the thousand dollars and I give you a, you know, $1,000 bills, right? If you didn't know, you'd never think to ask me for the thousand dollars, right? The sixth graders would all be out of luck unless you told them that they could get a thousand dollars for asking for it. The same thing is true when it comes to Jesus. Jesus offers us a free gift, the gift of the forgiveness of our sins and the opportunity to spend eternity with him in heaven. But you can't know what you don't know. You can't ask for God's forgiveness if you don't know it's available to you. And so it's important <clears throat> that we, as Christians, pray together when there are needs, when there are things that we seek to accomplish. I look at our nation and I look at the division that's in our country there is more division in our country today than I have ever seen maybe maybe as the only time that's ever been greater was the Civil War the answers that we're seeking they're not political they're spiritual what this nation really needs is not another politician. What this nation needs is Jesus. And what we really need is for Christian people to pray that God will send a revival to this nation. That God will unify this nation and bring us back together. I'm not saying that we shouldn't vote, and, and I'm encouraging every one of you to do so, right? But the real root of our problem is that as a nation, we've walked away from God. We've turned our back on Him. You see, it's Christianity that teaches us to take care of those who are in need, the widow and the orphan. It's Christianity that tells us to love our neighbor. It's Christianity that tells us to teach other, to treat other people the way that we want to be treated. It's Christianity that says to place other people, consider other people as more important than yourself. If we would do those things as a nation, a lot of the problems that we are struggling with would take care of themselves. The missionary at, um, at camp said that in the Old Testament, those people were taught that there were 613 commands and laws that they were to obey. Do you know how many Jesus gave us? Two. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second command is to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, if we do those two things, if we do those two things, I'm not going to take the Lord's name in vain. I'm not going to worship false gods. I'm not going to defraud my neighbor or lie to my neighbor or steal from my neighbor. Because if I get those two things right, the rest of it will fall into place. If we as a nation turn back to God and seek Him, a lot of these other problems that we're struggling with, they'll take care of themselves. The final thing for effective prayer, it requires persistence. It requires persistence. In Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, it says this. 
One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to illustrate their need for constant prayer and to show them that they must never give up. There was a judge in a certain city. He said, who was a godless man with great contempt for everyone. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly appealing for justice against someone who had harmed her. The judge ignored her for a while, but eventually she wore him out. I fear neither God nor man, he said to himself, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. The Lord said, listen to what the unfair judge said. God will always give what is right to his people who cry out to him day and night. And he will not be slow to answer them. I tell you, God will help his people quickly. But Dan, doesn't God already know what I need before I ask him? Yeah, yeah, he does. But sometimes our persistence in prayer shows us what's important to us. When I was growing up, well, when my kids were growing up, They'd watch the cartoons on Saturday, and they'd see uh, the commercials, and they'd see this toy that would be on the commercials, and they'd come up to me and say, Dad, I want that for Christmas, right? And then the next commercial would come on, and they'd see that toy, and they'd come up to me and say, Dad, I want that for Christmas, right? And the next one would come on, and I want that for Christmas. But as a parent when you start getting the same request over and over and over again, you begin to understand that maybe that's something that they really do want. Right? And I think that's kind of the same way for us with prayer. God knows everything, right? He sees our heart. He sees our motives. He sees, you know, what we're feeling and, and, and seeing. He knows what we need and what we don't need. But he calls for us to be persistent in prayer. And I think maybe that's more for us than it is for him. Because it helps to show us what's really important to us. If I'm willing to pray for it over and over and over again, well, then that must be pretty important to me. Daniel, in the Old Testament, had had this vision this dream and he sought for understanding and he began to pray for understanding and the Bible says that he prayed for 40 days before he got an answer and an angel appeared to him and he said Daniel on the very first day that you prayed I was sent to answer your prayer and to show you the meaning of this dream that you had this vision that you had But he said, I was detained. It might have been 21 days, not 40. I'm not sure. Um, But he said, I was detained by the prince of Persia, by this this demon that's referred to as this prince of Persia. And he said, I struggled with him until Michael, the archangel, came to help me. And I was able to give you the answer to this dream or vision that you have. But he says, I've got to go back for there is no one to stand against him save Michael, your prince, the the angel who is in charge of Israel. Just like there's this demon over Persia, Michael was the angel who is in charge of the nation of Israel. Sometimes our prayers are delayed not because God doesn't, want to answer them but because there's a spiritual war that's taking place 
you, your prayer life can be effective. Your prayer life can be powerful. You don't have to be a priest or a preacher to have a powerful prayer life. But you will get out of your prayer life what you invest into it. If you invest very little into your prayer time, you'll get very little back out. But if you treat it as it's truly important as it is, you'll see results. This morning, if you have a decision that you'd like to make, we invite and encourage you to come as we sing our invitation hymn. Our invitation hymn is hymn number 414. And let's stand as we sing the first and the final verse of hymn number 414. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your love and for your grace and for your mercy and for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Help us to realize, Lord, that through Jesus' sacrifice, each and every one of us as your children have the right to come directly to your throne through prayer. We don't have to go through a priest or a preacher, but the Heavenly Father, that we have become individually a royal priesthood of believers and that we have direct access to your throne. Help us, Lord, to serve you and to seek you and to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.